Check, check, one, two. Hello. How's everybody doing? Just getting things set up here. Everybody get enough stuffing? Enough turkey? Everybody, welcome. How's everyone? Thanks, everyone's Thanksgiving for those of us who are in the United States. We got a lot of food, friends. Fortunately, no family for me as they're all out of state. So I stayed put in general, but uh, it was nice. It's nice to be with some family of good friends. Yeah, just kind of gorged ourselves on wonderful food and laughter and drinks. It was good. It was a good time. Hope everyone had a good holiday. Maybe some of you got some Black Friday deals. I didn't buy a single thing. But that's okay. So we're getting back to these guys. Been so busy on another project or two that it's like, it's like, where am I with this again? <laughs> the never-ending Cupid Psyche piece. Uh, I've got to, got to make some progress here today. Uh, so hopefully, most of you guys know where we are with this and have been following. But if you haven't, welcome. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to let me know. Yeah, sorry, I was up super late and uh, kind of just got up like a couple hours ago and uh, <laughs> got my coffee right here. So I'm, uh, I'm still kind of, you know, ratcheting up. <laughs> just being honest man stay up until like three or four in the morning you're not gonna get up at seven no problems so i stayed in slept in anyway um yeah so i remember before uh on last stream i was trying to work on this hand and then we got a ton of questions and that led to just a lot of dialogue and i thought it was pretty good so i think we all had a good time for those of us who were those of you guys who were there. Um, but yeah, trying to get back to this hand. I'm just going to work my way up the hand and around the rest of the body. And kind of get some anatomy looking uh, accurate. And um, yeah, so anyway, if anyone has questions, let me know. I'm actually listening to some Christmas music right now, the Jazz Christmas Playlist on Spotify. If you look it up on Spotify, you'll find like two, I think two or three major playlists that people put together, and there's a lot of good stuff on there. Some of it's kind of generic, but it's it's pleasant. And I am a, uh, I'm a nostalgic cheese ball man. I like Christmas music. Not all of it, of course. There's some of it that's just terrible, but... There's a lot of good, I like a lot of Christmas music, and classic stuff, you know, jazz and, uh, you know, classics like Nat King Cole, Angie Williams, 
uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an old man trapped in a young man's body. <laughs> Maybe not that young anymore. I don't know. But uh, I like a good Christmas tune, man. I like the Christmas time. I always have fun with my family and extended family. We'd always get together and go to my aunt's house for Christmas when I was a kid. Sadly, that's changed, but we would, uh, a lot of us would always, you know, cousins and cousins' kids and aunts and uncles and my cousins, and, you know, all those people just come over and we'd all just hang out, pig out. Laugh. Sometimes a little bit of arguments here and there. <laughs> Mostly just laughter. Though. A lot of good times. Catching up. But it's funny, you know, you have these great memories from your childhood. I'm sure, you know, you're lucky to. And, uh, but it's like you're a kid. So you, all this is, you know, all these memories and all these events are through the filter of a child's mind. And then as you get older, I don't know, I've been thinking like, man, it'd be nice to get everyone together again because... As you all get more mature, you can all have conversations that you obviously just weren't able to have as a younger person. And now that we're all more on the, uh, you know, same page, it would just be interesting to um, kind of re, you know, re introduce, you know, your, it's not really reintroduce, I'm not sure what the right word is, but re get to know your cousins and your aunts and uncles from a more um, adult perspective. Now and then it happens, you know, randomly throughout the year or under different circumstances, sadly, like if there's a funeral or a birthday that you were able to make, if you guys are all apart and you get to get to get, you know, get the chance to get together. But um, anyway, I don't know. It's just always interesting to uh, revisit familiar family members or uh, distant ones and kind of get to know them again and rediscover kind of who they are and maybe they find it interesting who you've become. Maybe you guys have more in common. Maybe you don't. But anyway, I don't know. I'm uh, when I'm interested in people, I'm very interested in them. So, and I have some family who work in some kind of cool places and do some pretty cool things. So it's fun to pick their brains. Some of them are retired and still very cool too. Very interesting folk. And half of my family is uh. My extended family, my immediate family is full, full blood Spanish, but my uh, extended family are half immigrants and half uh, Americans and uh, born, you know. So it's always interesting to hear about, uh, you know, both sides, but my families who are from Latin America, it's interesting to hear about some of their experiences down there and in the process of. Uh, you know, assimilating into American culture back in the 70s and 80s, you know, so it's interesting to hear, interesting to hear their perspectives and what they've, uh, what they've gone through and adapting to a whole new culture and learning the language and, you know, applying for jobs. And I mean, they all came over as university graduates and of course they came legally and worked very hard and you know, had to work their way up. But, um, Still, there's, you know, no matter how educated you are, if you don't know the language perfectly or very well, there's definitely a barrier there that creates uh, interesting struggles. You know, sometimes they'll get mischaracterized or misjudged because they have an accent. Other times, um, you know, they just have hilarious stories of not understanding certain words or certain gestures or certain, you know, cultural norms of America. And so <laughs> they have some funny, some pretty funny uh, recounts of their... Uh, experiences here and adapting to life in America back in the 70s and 80s. So it's, it's cool to hear stories like that. And, you know, like a lot of family members, you think you've heard it all and then they drop some crazy bomb, some holiday, and they're like, remember back in 78, this happened or whatever. And they'll be like, no, I wasn't alive then. Tell me, <laughs> you know, and uh, anyway, I don't know. It's fun. I get nostalgic about the holidays. I like meeting with friends and family and just just having fun, having a good time, conversating and going into food comas. <laughs> good times. Anyone else out there have a good holiday? Anyone else have a, a 
surprisingly good Thanksgiving this year. I know a lot of people stayed home or stayed away from certain family members or friends because they didn't want to risk anything. And I respect that. Um, I didn't get to see my immediate family or my 101 grandmother. My grandmother turned 101 uh, the day before Thanksgiving. It's her birthday. So a bunch of my extended family and I and you, uh, yeah, just all extended family. Uh, we all hopped on a Zoom call and at least wished her a happy birthday from all over America, and some of them were in Latin America. That was cool, you know. I mean, I'm sure she, sadly, she won't remember in like a few days. Uh, she's dealing with some Alzheimer's and and uh, dementia, so she's she's getting up there, you know, which is as expected. If you're over 100, that's not uncommon. It's remarkable when people cross the 100 barrier mark, the centurion mark, and they're completely cognizant and there. That's really, that's really incredible. Um, but she's still, you know, she's hanging in there folks are my mom and dad she lives with my mom and dad now so she's getting as much care and attention as she possibly could really respect them for that because a lot of people don't get to either they don't have that kind of connection with their parents or they uh can't uh you know in one way or another afford to have them in home and take care of them themselves but thankfully my folks are um were able to help her out. She's my only grandparent. All my other grandparents have uh, passed on. So we all affectionately call her Mamita, even though, of course, that literally means mother. That's sort of uh, because most of us were born here in the States. Um, when I say us, I mean my generation of family members, extended family, my cousins and whatnot. Um, we still affectionately call her mother even though we know she's Abuelita, which is Spanish for grandmother. It just feels weird saying Abuelita instead of Mamita, even though, yeah, you know, it's, it's not technically correct. Term of endearment. It's funny how all these, uh, I don't know if you guys, I'm sure a lot of you have the same experience where, like, your friends call their grandmother something different. It's neither unique to their you know, immigrant background, whether they're from Poland or Germany or, you know, wherever. And there's always different phrases. And uh, I remember a friend of mine growing up in high school, uh, he would call his grandmother um, Mima. <laughs> I always thought that was funny. Um, I forget. I think that's a, is that a German thing? I forget. I think he has a German, German and something else maybe mixed background. I don't know. I always just thought it was funny, but she was a sweet woman. So I come over to his place and we play N64. <laughs> Back then, that was like what was it, the mid 90s or late 90s. We were playing a lot of Goldeneye and uh, Half Life. We played a lot of Half Life too, and good memories. Tearful talk. Oh, I'm not tearful at all. No. Is my abuelita okay? Also, hi. <laughs> no, I'm not tearful at all. Sorry, I'm just sort of maybe melancholy in my recounting, but I'm not. I'm not sad at all. Uh, I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm just waking up still. Uh, no, my mate grandmother's fine. I mean, as fine as you can be for 101. Thanks, Vasquez. Uh, yeah, she's uh, you know, she's got a little dementia and a little Alzheimer's, but uh, you know, I mean, so she's okay. She's okay as can be for her condition. Thanks for asking. But yeah, I'm just amazed that, you know, she's still kicking with us and she just celebrated her 101st, so it's, it's pretty good. I hope I can make it to that. That'd be pretty cool. Well, I say I hope, but I mean, I hope I can make it there with all my faculties, you know. If, if you're not remembering yesterday, I'd be bummed. But then you won't know that you're not remembering it, so I, you know. But, you know, it'd be nice to uh, to remember your daughters and sons' names and your family and all that. And that's what's slipping, sadly. Started with little things that were could be potentially important, you know, like remembering to turn off the stove or remembering to uh, take your medicine, <clears throat> excuse me, that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, so once that started kicking in, we realized, uh, my parents realized, like, yeah, it's probably time to... Uh, figure out how to make sure she's okay for the future.
furniture. And that's when uh, we decided to have her move in with me. So, anyway. I know, not everybody cares about married family stories. Sorry, I'm just sort of in the void, speaking into the void of 54 people. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. What, what does Ray say? I missed a couple things. Oh, thanks, Frankie. Appreciate it. Um, what program are you using? I <laughs> have Maximum Cinema 4D Blender. This is ZBrush, dude. You're on Pixelogic's, uh, what are you on? Facebook. You're on Pixelogic's Facebook page. Yeah, 101 is nuts. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as long as she's not trying to put on pants and shirts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you, dude. Yep. It's uh, from what I hear from my parents, because, you know, I, I I really wasn't living with them. When they, I mean, I lived, was living with them for a little bit back, like, over a decade ago um, when they had her move in with them. I think it was maybe, like, 15 years ago now? Maybe more? I don't know. I forget how long she's lived with them now. But she moved. I gave her my old room, actually, and I moved into it downstairs. We have one other bedroom downstairs in her, the lower living room. And, uh two-story house you know and, um, so i moved out of my old room so she could live on basically one floor and so anyway um she moved in just before i moved out kind of like a few years after she moved in and moved out um but uh she was fine then she really you really couldn't tell that much was going on you know but uh but now yeah it's a big difference All right, I think I might have made the palm a little too bulky because I'm thinking of my hand. <laughs> I'm like making that palm kind of meaty, and that's probably not, not the most feminine. Uh, I got to work on this a little bit. It's probably a little inflammated right now is what it looks like. A little inflamed, a little malformed here. But we'll get there. It's going to make it a little bit more feminine. Not so, like, masculine. Smooth some of this out. But it just felt too like it was too spindly, too thin, too twiggy, so. Cool, I remember A78 well. <laughs> Especially the Blizzard of 78. It was a child then. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> nice. Exodus, what's up? Yeah, I remember there was a Blizzard too. Man, we don't I don't even feel like there's there's where I grew up, I was Pennsylvania. And it's like we haven't had blizzards, a real blizzard there in forever. Um I mean it really in the last like couple last decade or two. It just kept getting warmer and warmer, and it was just sort of like summer, 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 winter. It was like no fall, and now it's like then after that's winter, 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 sp uh, summer. <laughs> it's like no spring. It just jumps from basically one season to the other, and it kind of sucks because uh, I like the fall a lot, although I'm not there anymore. So, you know, now it's just sort of colder summer, warmer summer. <laughs> that's how LA is. I mean, it definitely gets chilly, depending where you are in the area. Like a friend of mine, and we spent Thanksgiving, I spent Thanksgiving with a friend of mine and their family, and uh, they're up out a ways, and uh, more east inland area, and uh, I'll tell you what, man, you get up in the mountains, Cali, it definitely gets chilly, man. They could get snow. It got to like 37 or something one night. It's cold. <laughs> It's chilly, especially when you're used to like right now. It's like seventy degrees outside here, Fahrenheit. So it's nice and if you're wearing black. You get warm quick. It's a warm temperature, nice pleasant temperature. But yeah, um, yeah, I miss blizzards though. They're they're fun. I remember what year was it? Ninety five. 90? I don't remember. There was a couple there was a couple of big blizzards in the 90s that I remember as a little kid. I was born in 82, so uh, I remember one of those blizzards, though, man. I, I could just jump into a snow drift on the side of the house, and I just sank in, like, up to my, it was up to my, my chest or my neck. It was, it was crazy. It was awesome. But I don't really miss that cold of weather. I just miss the fall. I like those crisp mornings. I have a lot of memories of I don't know why and for me i have a lot of memories of like fall when i was in college i guess because you had to get up for your 8 a.m classes it was goddamn 8 a.m classes Ugh. it's 
So you have to get up early and you get your hot coffee and then you just walk across campus to your class and see all the trees. So I went to college and went to the university in Pennsylvania as well. And uh, beautiful to see the trees changing. You know, in the fall, all the leaves turning orange and yellow and red. And they have a certain smell to them too, a certain scent. It's really nice. Such clean air. It's like I forget about it. Like when I was up in the mountains or toward the mountainish area this uh, holiday, the air is just so much cleaner than <laughs> right where I live, where there's just a lot of traffic. It's like you forget what that clean air smells like. You get so you know you adapt to whatever's whatever's near you. It's interesting. Man, I remember a friend of mine when we played, uh, we were playing N64, we'd also play, we wouldn't be able to play it together because it was one player game, but uh, Shadows of the Empire, oh, it was a great Star Wars game on the N64. I think they ported it to PC. I haven't looked for it or played it in forever, but I remember they had a lot of uh, John Williams music in there and some other composer composed other soundtrack music for the game that sounded very similar to, uh, it fit into the style of John Williams for Star Wars. It was pretty cool. That's definitely a game they should remake today with the graphics they can get now man that new star wars game they released um fallen order that was pretty good on a uh, ps4 oh man they should redo shadows of the empire today It'd be incredible make a great uh series too it's definitely mandalorian-esque anyone else out there watch mandalorian after your 8 a.m classes try Try waking up at 5 a.m. to take the bus for your 80. Oh, man. Supreme ruler of the world. I'm banning thought. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, I mean, yeah, I had to be there for 8 a.m., so I probably got up at, like, 6.30. So it's still pretty pretty cruel and unusual in my book, man. I'm not a morning person. I mean, I can be when I have to, of course, but now that no one's going into studios, it's like, Whatever, man. Get the job done any hour you can. It's like, I will stay up late much more than I will get up early. I'm not a morning person. My natural lean is nighttime. Crazy late, which becomes crazy early. But it's hard for me to go to bed early and wake up early. It's just not me. I can do it. just don't like it. A friend of mine recommended I watch um, The Family Man with Nicolas Cage last night, so we watched that, and uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it the whole way through. I feel like I've seen clips of it, but anyway, I watched it last night, and uh, this is a gr they just do a great job. He did a great job of acting like he's waking up in the very early morning when the alarm goes off, and his wife tells him to get up, it's time to go to work, and he just is like, I remember that feeling so much when I had to get up for different jobs or classes or just whatever when I was younger, and it was like... You're a true zombie. Like, your eyes are still closed. Your brain just wants to be asleep. But you're moving your body like it's almost like an out-of-body experience. You're like, okay, move left leg, move right leg. Ugh, move body. Ambulate. <laughs> Walk. And uh, you just want to die. You just want to go back to sleep. It's the worst feeling. It's so terrible. And you just get so... You're so cranky, too. Or at least you just don't... You just don't want to be awake. You're like, no. Sleep was so nice. It was all warm and cozy in my sheets and I'm like man that is a good visual illustration of what it feels like just the pain of waking up too early and you just force your body to like down coffee and just wake up and it's such a terrible <laughs> it feels like such a horrible way like it feels abusive to yourself it feels like nah that's not that's not healthy it's not really what we're supposed to do we just have to do it and we just force ourselves to because the job requires us to be there at x amount of time at X hour of the morning. I'm all about, man, you know, like Supreme Ruler. If I ever became a Supreme <laughs> Ruler, I'd just be like, nah, four day work weeks. You know, uh, everyone has Friday through Sunday off. And uh, 
You can work from home if you want. Just get the job done. Don't care how you get it done. Just get it done. And then maybe like twice a month, every Thursday, or every, twice a month, every twice a month on Thursdays, you would have a, a time where you're allowed to do whatever you want as long as it's relevant to the company and and you contribute that knowledge to uh, to your job. I forget what other companies have done that, but they've shown in in different uh, uh, different tests they've shown that people are more productive that way when you give them some autonomy and let them invent or innovate on their own it's pretty cool the results are better they're happier they work harder they provide more for the company all that stuff interesting interesting studies of course that's the thing is you got to hire the right people who would be you know self-motivated and self-disciplined that kind of thing you gotta hire the right kind of people and all that. But yeah, I think there could be a definite structural reforming in the US for how we manage people's time and work. Anyway, sorry, I'm missing some chat. What do we got? Uh sorry, so uh Hall Mong is asking what is the whole project? Uh I'll show you. Do -do. This is Cupid and Psyche, the sequel <laughs> to my my per, my first piece. That was a remake of Antonio Canova's masterpiece. So this is a top-down view. Here's your front view. So he's uh, carrying her out of Hades, uh, the uh, mythological version of hell. He's rescuing her. In the story, she was deceived to go down into Hades to retrieve a vessel that would supposedly make Cupid fall in love with her forever. And that was Venus who lied to her, who's Cupid's mom. And uh, she was jealous of Psyche's love for Cupid. And so, uh, if I remember correctly, Venus created a potion or whatever that would put Psyche to sleep forever. It's basically kill her, except she was you know, in a coma or whatever. Kind of like the orig original Sleeping Beauty kind of thing. So that put her into a deep sleep, and then Cupid eventually found out. And then descended into hell to save her. And so he woke her up with a kiss. So Sleeping Beauty. And uh, now he's pulling her out of there. So just figured I'd continue the saga. So that's what this uh, that's what this piece is. So yeah, just working on the hand. Just <clears throat> didn't like the way the hand looked. I just kind of... Just reworking it, trying to keep it feminine. I was going too masculine with it, I think. It's making the joints a little too hefty and the pads and the meat in the palm a little too, much like mine, <laughs> too masculine for, uh, for a feminine hand. So trying to uh, find that happy medium of more form and better definition without getting too macho. She's got man hands, if you guys remember Seinfeld. <laughs> Don't want to give her man hands. I want her to have effeminate hands. Elegant hands. Anyway. Uh, it was in Jersey then. Penn got the blizzard of 78 too. Yeah, I'm sure they did. My sister probably remembers that. Maybe not, actually. She I think that's when... Was she born in 78? Was she, born in 78? she was born in 78. Yeah, she was born in 78. Never mind. She wouldn't remember that. <laughs> uh... Daytime is overrated. Night owls know the joy of Adult Swim infomercials and Angel. Oh. <laughs> Angel. I never got into Angel or Buffy or any of that stuff. But uh, Adult Swim for sure, man. My, that's how I discovered uh, Cowboy Bebop. My sister was up late. I got her to stay up late too because I was a corruptive influence as a. We were just we we're a late night family. My family was always up crazy late. Um, in general, I think it's maybe partly a Latin thing. I don't know. But um, but yeah, she introduced me to Cowboy Bebop. She's like. You should check out this anime. She would watch a lot of anime then. Uh, certain ones, but still more, way more than I did because I didn't watch any. And I was very anti-anime. Still kind of am because there's a lot of weird crap out there that I'm not into. But Bebop is very westernized. It's very like Star Wars without aliens kind of thing, you know. It's like Firefly definitely was a ripoff of Bebop in some ways. Anyway, um, that's what got me hooked on Cowboy Bebop. And now that's why it's my favorite uh, anime. You know, there's others I like, but 
Uh, yeah, I've yet to find something that really hooks me like uh, like Bebop did. It's humor and interesting storytelling. I mean, I know it's not perfect. I've heard people rip on it, but uh, it's still got a lot of, a lot of something that attracts people. I mean, that's why it's so highly rated. And the voice actors are awesome. The American, the U.S. voice actors are incredible. Has anyone watched, uh, speaking of voice actors, it's got me thinking about uh, Stephen Bloom, and then it also got me uh, thinking of uh, Ron Paulson, who's another great voice actor who does the voice of Pinky from Animaniacs, and he also does the voice of uh, Yakko from the Animaniacs. Or should I say Pinky in the Brain and Animaniacs, but it's all kind of the same. Anyway, they just re-released, or just released a uh, reboot of uh, Animaniacs, and I gotta say, it was pretty funny. It's pretty fun. Just watched, I just binge-watched it all when I was working on another project the other day. It's only like uh, 13 episodes, but they have season two coming, so I guess they kind of were just, you know, plowing through them uh, when they were making them. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. I gotta say, I'm more fond of the uh, Animaniacs than Pinky and the Brain, so I kind of wind up skipping the pinky in the brain actually after a while i watched one or two other episodes and i was like eh, it's not quite my thing but animaniacs man classic funny witty witty banter <laughs> i love whenever they would get like innuendos and double entendre jokes and whatever going on then yeah i could always be like good night everybody <laughs> yeah, it's just good stuff man There was one clip, someone took a snapshot of it, and they were like, uh, I think it's like there was some pilgrim who was looking for a turkey. It was a Thanksgiving episode, and uh, it's like, you will give me the bird! <laughs> and then Yakko's like, believe me, I'd love to, but the fox sensors won't let us give you the bird, you know? Good times. Or like Beethoven, there's the episode where they meet Beethoven, and he's like, I am a pianist! And they're like, you're What? We're going to wash your mouth, Mr. Potty Mouth, with soap. <laughs> immature five-year-old humor. Twelve-year-old humor. I don't know. I was a sucker for it, man. Since this is noodling around, I mean, this isn't going to be the most exciting stream today, probably, but just trying to get some, some nice-looking hands here. Decent looking cuticles. <laughs> and I'll probably subdivide her up again because obviously we're kind of lower res here. It's not the, uh, this was Z remesh too, so it's not the greatest topology as you can tell. It's a little, a little gnarly, but a little subdivision will be fine. This was Z remesh from a, de a decimated version of this too, so that's why there's like a lack of great topology and weird forms there and some malformed areas and whatnot. Anyway. Uh, the new Animaniacs has jokes as good as fingerprints. Fingerprints? Fingerprints? Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Vasquez. Maybe I, uh, I've forgotten. You have to remind me, refresh my memory, what are, what is fingerprints? Did you mean literally prints, like the pun? Or did you mean prints? It looks okay. 
Uh, okay, so when when they're looking for fingerprints, and then they find prints, but they mean fingerprint. Oh. <laughs> nice. Um, I don't. I forget that episode, man. I've got to go back and rewatch the original like fifty million episodes. Um, I have some pretty good jokes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say there's some episodes that are kind of it's like hit and miss, but overall, I'd say they did a good job. Uh, you know, I'd say it's like an eight out of ten. You know, eight out of ten land pretty well. It's really whatever, 13, you know, but um, they basically have like two Animaniacs episodes or mini episodes within one whole episode has two Animaniacs sandwiching a Pinky in the Brain segment. And so I just wound up skipping over most of Pinky in the Brain stuff and just started watching the bookends of the Animaniacs. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. You know, I'd say some areas could be better and it could be a little less, um, a little less clear on their politics just to keep everybody happy as opposed to taking a hard clearly hard line in one direction but you know whatever it's their show uh it's still you know and plus it's like when you get so political and even cartoons it's almost like you know it's like you can't escape it, it kind of gets old like you kind of want some escapism where you don't have everybody like preaching your the same politics in everything it's like god we get it people like move on like stop being so obsessive uh and so angry and hateful it's like just, just we want comedy we don't even necessarily need political comedy and everything so that got a little irritating, honestly. It's like, we know, we know where you guys stand. Not everybody cares. Not everybody wants to hear political satire all the time. So there's that. And I'm just like, ugh. It's like, you could at least be more subtle with it. Like, you could be a little bit more classy in how you make your jokes instead of being so, you know, heavy handed. It's like, it's kind of shitty writing. It's kind of bad writing. And you're so clear. It's like, yeah, dude, it's, it's only funny for like maybe 50% of the population. Man. Or barely, even if you're, even if you lean that way, it's not like you always want to hear it, you know, anyway. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect, but it was good. It's still funny. There's still a lot of good stuff to be had. And I can laugh at people making fun of both sides easily. It's just, you know, I just like to see more balance or just more neutral kind of stances on some things. Remember when the default was that people were decent and comedy was meant in good fun instead of being a political statement? Yep. Pepperidge Farms <laughs> remembers. Pepperidge Farms. Like the cookie, the cookie company, the bread Pepperidge Farms. <laughs> I guess they're cookies only, right? I don't know. They make pastries, right? <laughs> nice work. Uh, but the palm is too smooth, needs a touch. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's definitely going to be texture. I was just smoothing it out to kind of get the form better. Um, I kind of grasp what, what uh, Walter Pereira, PR is saying, but I'm not, sorry, I'm not the best at reading Spanish and understanding everything. Uh, uh turn it up or else. Uh, hey Vasquez, you want to translate for me? <laughs> If you don't mind, what are they asking? Sorry. Uh, can you link or show a good tutorial for uh, realistic fur? Ah, oh. a realistic fur tutorial? Uh, I can send you to a buddy of mine I used to work with. He does some stuff for XGen. But do you want to learn how to do good fur in in ZBrush? I'm assuming. Uh, because I don't know off the top of my head of any great um fur tutorials for ZBrush. Uh, Spicer, what's up, brother? It's been filled with awesome streams. Wish every, every day was like this. Well, <laughs> thanks, dude. Welcome. Spicer's another streamer. He's also with uh, the uh, stream team of Pixelogic. You're obviously not the best at reading Spanish. No, I'm not. It's Portuguese. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. See? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the best linguist. Yes, yeah, rush Okay. Um. hilarious uh yeah i can't say that i know of any specific i don't have any go-to uh for tutorials and 
at ZBrush. I mean, I would do what I'm just gonna do what you would do, you know, just hop into YouTube and type in uh, her in ZBrush. You know, there's Michael Pavlich did uh, he did something on it back. I mean, Michael's great. He does so many great tutorials. I'm sure you guys know Michael. Um, I mean, I can just send you this. You know, he's on the top of this search, I believe. It was done two years ago, so, and Fiber Mesh hasn't been updated in eternity. So, if you want to learn Fiber Mesh and how to do fur in ZBrush, there you go. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't have any better answers for you. I mean, I've done it myself. I've done some fur here and there for sure. Uh, but when it comes to 3D printing, it obviously doesn't really make that much sense to try to lump hair together, big thick fibers, and then dynamesh it or whatever. It just turns into a mess. So I've wound up just sculpting fur when I have to 3D print it. Um, but I've done I've done some fiber mesh hair and fiber mesh fur here and there. But um, it seems like oh, I was gonna say if you wanted to if you have Maya, I'll show you my buddy uh, Omar. He has a really great Peter tutorial on uh, on XGen and how to put it into um, into into Unreal. I think is how he showed it, or it's just at least okay. It's fast for a guide placement. So he did some pretty good stuff on that. Um, and again, I'll send you this search from YouTube. Just check him out. Um, Omar's great in that he's pretty concise and pretty straight to the point. Uh, I've actually asked him for pointers on different aspects in Maya and other other things. So that's Omar's guide on XGen for guides. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the extent of where I'd go right now for fur. And I'm probably going to follow some of that too because um, it looks like XGen and uh, Ornatrix play nicely with Unreal. And Unreal has its own hair system, but you can give it the guides, I think, from XGen and uh, Ornatrix and use that to uh, dictate your, uh, you know, your uh, hair flow and whatnot. So Vasquez, how was your Thanksgiving, dude? Did you have fun? Did you get a lot of food? Just looking at my own palm to kind of get where some of the folds are. And I'll, I'll sharpen this up later. Actually, I'm going to smooth it out and then I'll just sharpen up some of the details a little bit.
So does anybody know Portuguese? I'm sorry, I feel bad I wasn't able to answer that question because I can't. Um, yeah, Thanksgiving and birthday around the same time. It's presents ever nice. Oh, she's just let's do a Google Translate. Where was that? Portuguese question. They're still here. Where was it? There it is. Let's see how good Google Translate is. It's always funny when people do stuff and translate it from some other language to English, and it sounds hilarious. Expecting Spanish, not Portuguese. Interesting. And the question apparently is to model a character with a certain pose, he does it with, and it says Zephra, I guess he meant Z spheres, or with tails. So maybe it is Portuguese and it's just putting it in Spanish. Tails. Model, okay, so then for Portuguese it says to model a person with a particular pose using the sphere or the esters. <laughs> I don't know what it means by esters. Uh, I maybe mean, it means other, like other way of doing it with a transpose line. Um, but to pose the characters, so for Walter, who asked, Walter PR, uh, I use, um, what did I use for them? I, I think, no, I just used transpose line, masking and transpose line. I didn't use uh, Z-sphere rig. Um, this was just faster and, and easier to, to set up, I mean, to uh, manipulate with... Uh, Masking and transpose line. Using polygroups helps a lot too. You polygroup stuff together, you can get, um, you know, easy selections of joints, so you can polygroup the hand, you polygroup the forearm, you know, polygroup even the elbow a bit, and you polygroup your bicep, shoulder, you know, break it up that way, then it can let you kind of manipulate um, different limbs rather easily. So that's what I recommend. Um, fitting up the Z-Sphere, you know, uh, Z-Sphere rig is, is pretty laborious. Uh, be tedious and I mean if you're going to use the same same you know scale and stance of human form I mean you guess you can kind of like plug and play like save your Z's for a rig out you know and then um, just drop it into your your next human um, character you know once you make one I guess you can always save it and use it again but it, I've always just found it to be finicky and then it'll, it'll like kind of bind it'll rig in a loose way to certain areas and you got to really refine it and put out an extra little you know, Z-spheres for, like, to simulate the ribs or to simulate areas that should be, you know, not influenced as much by other Z-spheres so they don't collapse on themselves. And it's just kind of, I don't know. It's, you know, some people like it, some people don't. I really haven't grown to be a big fan of doing it that way. I've tried it, you know, back when I was learning ZBrush a lot more. Um, I, I would I've tried a couple of times with characters like that, but, eh, it's not quite, it's not quite my cup of tea. But, you know, to each their own. Portuguese and Spanish, there's a lot of similarities. So even like spelling, that's why Google got through and off, I think, too, is because they're both a lot of words are spelled very much the same or very similar. But yeah, sorry, I'm not fluent in uh, anything other than English. It's terrible. Product of being born here, and parents are like, you must assimilate. 
the American. But I wish they would have been uh, better versed in the house in our language. I understand more than I speak. So I can catch like every three or four words and know what a conversation's about, but we lose translation usually. But yeah, I'm no uh not a Rhodes scholar when it comes to Spanish. To Espanol. All right, starting to feel better. Feel like I want to polish in some planes here a little bit. Now, kind of again, just help kind of sharpen some features up a little bit. And again, this is supposed to look like a statue. It's not supposed to look like photo real pores. You know, like we're not going Chris Costa. Chris, is it Costa Costa? If Chris is out there, if somebody knows Chris. I mean, I know Chris too, but I've never asked him directly. Like, hey. Is it Costa or is it Costa? How do you like saying it? But everyone knows Chris Costa's work and his incredible lifelike sculptures. This isn't going to that level. Um, I don't want it to look like a statue. Plus, that's just painfully. It's just it's just a really you have to really love what you're working on to go into that. And I love this, but I don't, I don't want to go into poor detail. It just feels like a little overkill for this. Especially on the stream, anyway. I mean, maybe I might put a little bit more detail and extras, you know, details into it down the line, but off stream. But who am I kidding? The odds are low. I seem to only work on this on stream because I usually have other stuff going on off stream. How long is a good time to work on a part? Like, is it worth to work on the hand for hours when no one is going to see it? <laughs> well, the hand will be visible for sure. This hand's right out front, actually. So, but you're right, underneath the hand, and actually, it's a good point. I mean, how many people are going to be like, Whoa. you're right, they're not going to see underneath the hand that much. Good point, but hey, still good practice. But yeah, you're right. It's a good point. Not going to see the palm actually that much, but hey, there it is anyway. Good practice. Um, should work on the knuckles, actually. That's what I should do. Finish up the outer detail that most people will see.
feel like I gotta subdivide now actually because I'm going to that detail. It's just not it's just not helping. Then again too, yeah, I mean the hand's probably only gonna be literally physically that big. Like an inch, maybe less than an inch. So, but then again, I don't know. I'm the one who likes crazy, stupid detail. I'm the one who's like, you know, put it in freaking feather ridges. And so I'm almost like on the 3D printing scale, this is like poor detail, I guess. Because you only have to use a magnifying glass to even see it. Um, but it'll still catch light. You'll see some ridges there, I guess. Maybe I don't need to so divide right now. I don't know. It's going to be a pretty tiny hand. Messy. Messy Geo right there. Ah, screw it. Whatever. Subdivide. She's not that big as far as poly count goes. Two million. Just make sure I got everything out there. All right. Divide. Could most printers even do that? Um, most no. I mean, it depends. Most most no. But I'm gonna be, you know, printing it on the form three, so you'll definitely see. You'll definitely see all these details. Just gotta look closely. Uh, it has a library of alphas on their site. Knuckle alphas too. Before they started flying, they have knuckle alphas. Really? I haven't looked for knuckle alphas ever on a Pixelogic site. Their old texture resources, the download resources page. I've only just looked for little simple things on there here and there. Oh, let's check that quick. Under skin, okay. Thank you. Just looking at a bunch of different alphas, I'll show you guys the screen. So this is on their resources page. This page. And I guess where are the knuckles? No, these, I guess these are it, right? There we go. Yeah. There we go. Baskets to the rescue. Yet again. Thank you, sir. Might as well save those, use those. Why not? Yeah, it's funny. I just never, never thought to look for that. I never did. I don't know. I just didn't think that they would have something like that specifically, but it makes sense. And just got to unzip those.
All right. I got those. So bring them into our alpha palette. As soon as it works, stop it. There it is. All right. But we want it under. Do something like this. Perfect. Beautiful. Done. <laughs> yes. Just got all kinds of what is the uh, shingles and just yes. That's nasty. Um, probably gonna blur it a little bit. Sweet. The fast knuckle, a little smoothing. That works. <laughs> ah, that went through. <laughs> It's all diseased. All right, way to do this properly is to uh, enable back face masking. Or you can just mask everything except that too, but I think back face masking should work nicely. So, otra vez. Spanish it means once again. Uh, here we go. Uh, oh wait, this was, dang it, it's before I subdivided. Divide. All right, one more time. Third of the charm. There we go. See? Back face masking. It's awesome. My voice is low. Keep it high, please. All right. <laughs> high register or something. Dog. <laughs> I'll talk up here, okay? <laughs> here, puppy. You're long like that? Make believe TV? <laughs> Here, puppy. <laughs> Why did I make me think of uh, what's his name from Family? Is it Family Guy? Herbert, Herbert the Pervert. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'll talk very quietly. Sorry, yeah, I'm still just kind of waking up, I guess, because I, uh, had a late night, so I told the stream earlier for those who weren't here that I uh I think I went to bed around like four or five. So I got up a few hours ago, a couple hours ago before this started. Because I was tired. I needed my beauty sleep. <laughs> this scruff isn't gonna, you know, maintain itself. What does that even mean? Um <laughs> Gulped her voice actor. Yeah, man. Now it's better. Keep it up, man. I will project louder. Get down here. Come here. Gulp the fingers. Yeah. 
<laughs> Talk louder. With more power. Don't sound like a girly man. Come on. <laughs> Is that better? Get down. Get to the chopper now. Ow. <laughs> My go-to. God bless Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not a tumor. Oof, looks scary. Let's try the other one. Numero tres. Nah, still looks diseased. <laughs> it's probably because I didn't soften it, right? Did I not do the same thing to this one? Yeah. Let's try to blur a little bit. Oops, wrong one. Not tile. Blur. If there's ever a world where kids don't know what an Arnold accent is, I don't want to live in it. Yeah, right? <laughs> That'd be scary. That'd be a sad world. And that's coming, man. That is in our future. I'm I'm sure of it. There's going to be young tykes in the future who are going to be like, Who's Arnold? What? Why does everyone say get to the chopper in such a weird way? Daddy, he's talking weird. I'm scared. Come on, do it. Put that cookie down. <laughs> that looks terrible. It could be salvaged, I guess, but eesh. just looks like a crusty, nasty, like a, a butcher's or a carpenter's heat up fingers. Some trucker who's left his hand to sit in the sun for like 20 hours a day just cooking there's not even 20 hours of sunlight what am i saying you know what i mean you've seen that video have you ever seen that picture that video there's like a picture of a trucker who's like he drove the same direction at the same time of the morning or day for like however many years and like half his face is like super wrinkled and like nasty and the other side's like way cleaner and smoother and it's just like wear sunblock you know or don't be in the sun all the time it's like anything in life you need a balance we definitely need the sun, man. Need your vitamin D now more than ever. Could be a sad day, Exodus says. It will be. Give me your opinion about about Gone Girl movie. Inside of the CGI. Who was in the seas and have you seen the film? Or better yet, don't be a trucker. Yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, we need him until Elon has, uh, you know, Elon or whoever, whatever, whatever other company is working on trucks that'll be automated, that'll just self drive. That'll be cool. But God forbid to get into an accident, man, because it's bad enough when human error kicks in. Imagine when it's going to be like a robot driving, an AI driving the truck, and then someone gets capitated by it plowing over them or something. Like, man. Car versus 18-wheeler accidents are the worst. It's just a miracle if someone survives that when they get in a big accident. Anyway, um, I used to work in the hospital, so I think about that stuff all the time. I, mean, I was in a bad car accident when I was a kid with my family. So, Seatbelts, man. Seatbelts look both ways and don't drive too fast. Um, I haven't seen Gone Girl, actually. Sorry. Um, I've seen parts, like small clips here and there. It just didn't really interest me or attract me that much. I mean, maybe I saw it even and I don't even remember because it just it just didn't interest me. But what is there? Is there a scene I can look up quickly? Um, like I can YouTube a CGI scene because it never came. It never thought of it as like an effects heavy movie. I'm sure that there's now obviously there's got to be a sequence or two that uses a lot of CG, but I never um, it never really interested me. So I, uh, you know. I know it won like an Oscar or two, and a lot of people, I know it got a lot of praise. I mean, I couldn't not hear about it back when it won whatever it was, an Oscar or whatever award it, or awards it won. But 
a movie winning awards doesn't impress me. It doesn't make me want to see it more. I know it does for some people, but often it's, again, a lot of times now more than ever currently and in the last few years, it's like awards are, are given, they're doled out to the movies that have the most politically correct message of the time, of the current era. And people who don't realize that have got to be living under a rock or just not putting two and two together. Um, so often a lot of movies will get accolades for their politics more than for their actual craft or the best story and best everything. Like I thought Interstellar should have been nominated in one best picture, in my opinion, because it just, again, pushed the medium of film forward in a way that we hadn't done before, as well as Gravity. I thought Gravity should have won best picture because, again, it pushed the medium forward. Um but there were other, you know, more politically relevant films at the time. And so, you know, or just there was like, you know, favoritism. You know, I think like Birdman won instead of, uh, it, it won, I think, in the year of Interstellar. And Interstellar wasn't nominated for Best Picture to begin with. But um, anyway, so whatever. Uh, but sometimes there's miracles that happen. Like, I think Lord of the Rings, Return of the King won Best Picture, which was like, holy crap. Like, that's amazing because... That's like, wow, an, an adventure sci or uh, fantasy piece of, you know, transposed literature made, you know, I mean, it made Best Picture. That was amazing. And it deserved it. I thought it totally, I mean, that was, you know, wrong clock is right twice a day kind of thing. I was like, wow, they actually made a good call. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty down on the Oscars at this point. I think it's, 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 a, lot of, it's a lot of Hollywood kind of, you know congratulating themselves, praising themselves, looking in the mirror and being like, you're beautiful. We love you. So I don't really like jump to movies that win all the awards or whatever. I'm like, I'll just watch the movies I like. But I heard Gone Girl was good from some people and I've heard other people say it was boring. So I've heard both sides, but I haven't, I have yet to actually sit down and watch it. So yeah, uh, what's the scene? What should I look up? Uh, how many voices can you manage? on one throat <laughs> what tablet do i use um for hacking a truck and causing domestic terrorism that could happen too yeah man that's scary even the whole thing with like the cyber truck being bulletproof i'm like mm, it's probably not a good idea because you don't want people who want to commit crime be able to hop into a readily available bulletproof vehicle i mean everyone would like to you know every good person would love to have a bulletproof vehicle but i think there's a lot of bad people who would like to have a bulletproof vehicle too and that's not good Especially they should be taken out um, by the cops. Anyway, uh, how many voices can I do? I don't know. I can do a bunch. I should put together a reel and try to like get some some voice acting gigs because I can I can do a range. Like I can commit to a a character and really just just do full on insane characters. My sister and I, when we were kids, we used to lay down together in front of this tape recorder, dual tape deck, and like make up stories and like make up whole audio stories and we do the different voices of different characters and sort of come up with the whole story and do all that we did that all the time as kids it's hilarious i'm sure my parents have some really funny cassette tapes somewhere buried in a box or in the library amongst all this other paraphernalia of our childhood um but yeah so we always did voices and I like trying to make people laugh. I'm I'm an idiot like that. I know that I'm not funny like half the time or it's like people are just gonna be like, whatever dude. But hey, I make my friends laugh a lot of times. <laughs> just do ridiculous stuff. Create ridiculous scenarios. Take lines, lift lines from other movies or, you know, I like a friend of mine and I we love a bunch of my friends actually love um, the movie Just Friends. Ryan Reynolds and Amy Smart. Hilarious. Great Christmas movie. Hilarious, like, relationships movie. Everybody's been there. And it's a true story, too. Obviously embellished, but it's a true story. The writer of the movie, of the story, the person who lived the story, um, is actually the dude in the metal shop when Anna Ferris is trying to, trying to sing her song called Forgiveness. And then he's like, hey, Ashley Simpson, forgive this. And he gives her the finger or something. And then... Uh, he's this like heavier guy with like he looks like a biker dude because they turned this coffee shop in the movie into a like a, a metal you know like rock band venue, and so they're all booing her and then she like jumps on him and starts like head you know banging him on his head on the ground just you know it's ridiculous over the top when she gets pissed, 
the obvious juxtaposition of she's singing the song about forgiveness and then she's like beating the crap out of some guy some biker and he's like i'm sorry oh my god ah, you know anyway um tons of one-liners in there great movie if you haven't seen it watch it hilarious and if you've ever been put in the friend zone you'll be able to relate quite well in some ways hilarious anyway um where am i going off with it i don't know why i was talking about that. voices characters oh we take lines from that and apply it to something else yeah i don't know All that kind of, oh my god your your names are clark and darla i want to eat you both up if you've seen it you know what i'm talking about it's just on affairs is crazy hilarious there's so many lines in that f this i'm mobile <laughs> just crazy chris klein oh my god hilarious dude ryan reynolds is awesome in it Thanks for reminding me I was fat. <laughs> oh, you're not a chubby bunny anymore. You're in my personal space. <laughs> so good. Anyone else seen Just Friends? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, Jamie Palomino. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, God. There's just certain lines that you would never be able to say to Like, I wouldn't even repeat what her dad says to him. when he's like, how'd you lose all that weight? Like that something from, re from, uh, <laughs> from who said it? I mean, like, you lose all that weight from that, that guy from Subway. <laughs> oh, my God. Her dad is like a Jersey dad. He's like totally just inappropriate. Just hilarious. So politically correct in some ways. It's freaking hilarious, dude. Oh, my God. If you haven't seen Just Friends, trust me, rent it buy it you'll laugh a lot it's very well done it's a, such a true there's so many truisms like so many truths of just like life if you've ever had a crush on anybody and worked hard to achieve something and then you've seen them again it's just all these different elements of how life works like how real life just happens and uh it's just it's so every beat it's every joke lands i think it's just so many it's funnier because it's real. Like a lot of this stuff happens. And of course it's exaggerated a lot, but it's like when you're trying to impress somebody and then the, all the things that could go wrong, do go wrong. But only that one time that you, that you were trying to like deliberately impress somebody or do something stupid. And you thought it was going to turn out right. And instead it turns <laughs> into a disaster. It's just like Murphy's law happening to a lot of us, you know, you're like, Oh yeah, I've done this a million times. It's going to work out great this time. And then it's the one time it fails terribly and you're horribly embarrassed and, of course it's in front of the girl or guy you wanted to impress and so you're just like oh god just let the earth swallow me right now i don't want to be here can i rewind time please that knuckle looks wrong i feel like this alpha is too sharp is this not no it's blurred what the heck i know i'm probably spending way too much time on this hand because it's like it's gonna be tiny but whatever we're almost done with the hand um, someone's writing in Russian. Can't understand Starshine. Does anybody know Russian off the top of their head? Uh, okay, sorry. So I'm going back up here. I missed a couple things. Um, just escalate. Give the cops tanks problem solved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just keep elevating the uh, <laughs> level of potential destruction. Uh, which one easier to sculpt? finger or toes i'd say they're probably i don't know probably toes are easier i think a little bit but they're both challenging in different ways because toes have that weird kind of curve underneath the toe and a lot of folds but maybe toes are a little easier because a lot of times they're kind of i don't know they're both challenging i think they got their their own issues hands are i think are more challenging probably though because they're they're more articulate you can have so much more expression in a hand and we see our hands so much like our faces we know when something's off you know and uh you know, there's this, we, and I also think people forget like how much, how much rotation doesn't happen at the wrists. Sometimes you'll see artists that'll turn the, the hand and it's like the wrist doesn't, the wrist doesn't rotate like this. It's your whole radius, hence the name radius. That's what turns your hand, right? This is what supinates and pronates your hand, you know, rotates it. You're not, you're not getting that from your wrist. You only basically do this and a little bit of side movement, but you don't get twisting without the forearm rotating. So something you remember for young artists who are trying to draw hands, you always remember it's the whole forearm that's twisting. You literally have muscles that are twisting and wrapping over each other. It's really, when you look at the muscle system of the forearm, it's really elegant, really beautiful, and how it all strings through into these fine little tendons. 
and ligaments that go through this area here and connect you know everything it's it's incredible the hand the human hand is amazing really incredible um amazing design here i wonder if this is probably a dumb idea what if subtraction is that no looks worse it's definitely for addition um what else did I miss? Going back to the CGI and the modeling and the Oscars, why do Lord of the Rings look so much better than The Hobbit? It's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure, honest. I, I, they got the lighting and just it's the whole thing with like Troll King. Is that the right term? Troll King? I don't know. Excuse me. I'm not the biggest like Tolkien like nut. I love the Lord of the Rings films, but um, I don't I don't know all the names of all the characters. I can't memorize all of them. I know a bunch of them, but um, so the troll, I think it was a troll king, right? Um, that whole scene looked super CG. Um, I, I mean, it's like any, when anything looks CG, it usually means a couple things. I mean, firstly, it's, it, you know, our eyes inter understand light and movement very well, uh, intuitively and weight. And so when the animation is wrong, when it looks, when it doesn't carry the weight of a real being, you know, um, there's that course then there's the lighting and materials they chose so if something looks too specular too like shiny you know too plastic like that's you know a quick giveaway that it's cg um and then of course there's the compositing how it blends into the two-dimensional footage so if it if it's sort of too bright and it doesn't have they didn't do an hgri mapping of the scene or they didn't create an accurate you know um digital you know, light reference and digital light setup, if it doesn't match really perfectly, it'll always feel like it's on top of everything or in front of everything or just not really there grounded. And then, of course, how the shadows, the contact shadows interact with, you know, the digital invisible plane that should be, you know, how it catches their shadow and where the lights are. So all of that kind of plays into how something is composited and how it looks in the final uh, version. And then there's also like ambient light and then there's fog and dust particles and atmosphere distance from the camera to the character all that should be measured and, and and really you know understood and so it's a lot you know and weta does an amazing job uh, but i don't know why it it sort of just felt too cartoony in the hobbit a lot but uh then the sequel i thought smog looked amazing um definitely cg but still just so much of his environment was all CG, so it worked because it was all in the same lighting was all cohesive because it was all, you know, vastly CG, where it was almost like everything was CG except um, Martin Freeman, I guess. So there was that and the other hobbits or the other um, are they hobbits. Yeah, whatever. Whatever the guy's name is. I can't remember the names. The other the dude with the beard, the, the dwarf dude. <laughs> anyway, and all his buddies. Um, so they were just running around green screen and everything else was CG. So they're the ones that kind of popped out a little bit at times because, uh, you know, they didn't have the volume. They didn't have the uh, the LED walls that we're using now with Unreal in Mandalorian and other shows like that. Um, so I think that's why, you know, in general, that's why things look more CG. I think they just did an incredible compositing job, really observed. It's like, it's like just, you know, it's like drawing shadows, you know, like you really pay attention to what every scene you know has where their lighting's coming from and where you know where shadows would fall and how things would be influenced and then, yeah i mean you still look at cg in the lord of the rings and the return of the king and all of them you still tell you can still tell it's cg but um there's a lot of shots where it's hard to tell you know or even like the eagles when the eagles come in at the end oh man it's so beautiful and it's so it looks so good it looks so good you like you know it's cg but just looking at it raw it's really hard at times to tell certain shots of them it just looks so fantastic so beautiful and so realistic. I, I love that film. I love the Lord of Return of the King. It's awesome. So inspiring. Um, anyway, yeah. So, I mean, it's like it's all on a case by case, shot by shot basis. You could have one movie that has some shots look incredible, and then the next set of shots might be handled by a different vendor. So, a different, a different, you know, um, studio. And maybe they didn't share assets of like lighting setups or, um, you know, there's a bunch of different hands that things pass through and somebody could have dropped the ball or not been as keen-eyed you know or maybe they had their attention pulled away because they're working on like three or four other movies and so one art director had to split his attention or her attention between different projects and so they kind of weren't able to dictate or guide or steer certain artists and you know refining certain shots and there's all these different factors that come into it that wind up causing a film's effects to not look as great as either its previous 
shots or other movies that the same studio worked on. You also have different artists. You know, there's a lot, just a crazy high turnover rate in uh, visual effects studios. Too high, in my opinion. Um, where it's like they just hire a bunch of you guys for one movie or a couple movies, and then they just let you go. And uh, it sucks because a lot of us would like a consistent paycheck, not having to worry about where's our next check coming from, which is hell. And uh, but that's super common, you know. It's rare. It's more much more rare for companies to say we're hiring you indefinitely. We want you here forever for as long as you want to work here. It's usually like, no, we got a contract. You got two months, maybe with a possible extension, you know, or whatever. It could be two months. It could be six months. It could be a year contract. Could be one month con you know depends on what the movie and the gig is um but yeah it kind of sucks when you want you know, like if you like a studio and you like the kind of projects they get um the other sad part is like a lot of a lot of studios you know the coolest the biggest movies and projects they all get sent to like out out of la so they go to london they go to vancouver you know they go anywhere but they go to australia they go to weta which is great for what and weta does great work but it's just the bummer for those of us who love this industry and who work here at the still with the birthplace of Hollywood, you know, birth where Hollywood is, the birthplace of filmmaking, really, modern filmmaking is here, and and a lot of us don't get to work in the coolest stuff because we've got to either live somewhere else now because of tax incentives. Like, that's why I'm pissed at our, for many reasons, our local government, because they should have incentivized, they should have insured and secured, you know, made California, California, <laughs> I don't know why it's Arnold came to mind. It should have made California like the place to attract this industry. And they should have kept it that way. And like idiots, instead of doing, making this the mecca of what where it should be, where it has been in a sense, and then making it the place to incentivize, to bring in more artists from around the world here rather than putting out the work cheaper. They should have figured out a way to make their number one industry in the world's whatever, in the fifth biggest economy, a third biggest economy in the world. They should have made that, like, ensure that this industry was super attractive and super affordable to do here. But instead, they've done the opposite. And so it's just almost everywhere else but here, Atlanta even, you know. Um, and it's great for those other places. I'm sure they're, they're loving that. Um, but it's just a bummer for those of us who really have just, you know, either put roots down here or just are committed to just staying here and really want to, um, you know, great weather and, uh, you know, just a great environment, um, geographically speaking, but politically it's just a mess right now. It's a shame. It's really a shame that we haven't had better state government, local government to, uh, to give us uh, a better industry here that was born here. So anyway, Different, different subject. Um, <laughs> you should try some voice work. I know I should. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I should. I should try it. I really. A friend of mine's a voice coach, and she's been telling me to do the same thing. She's told me to put together a reel and just send it out. You know, um, I I have fun with it, just goofing off. So I would love to be able to make some some cash doing it too. Um, because I yeah. My dad was on radio and TV when I was young, before I was born, actually. He was on radio and TV a lot in Latin America. He has a great voice. He's a better voice than me. Um, not that mine's anything great, but you know what I mean. Like, he's got a really strong, masculine, deep voice resonation. A lot of, a lot of depth. Um, oh, sorry. So what tablet I use? I'm, right now, I'm using a Cintiq Companion 2. Um, it's an older version of what the new one is now, which is uh, the Mobile Studio Pro. So it's a full computer when you disconnect it from your PC. It's its own, like, it's like a laptop, you know, power uh, level of computer. But it's just a Cintiq with a computer built in behind it. So it's just one one thick tablet, which is awesome. And you can just use a Bluetooth keyboard and your stylus on it. Uh, and then when you jack it into your computer and you plug it into the wall, now it just works like a regular Cintiq. So it's just your second monitor that, you know, has your pressure sensitivity. So that's what I use that. And then I have a regular 27 inch um, Asus uh, IPS monitor up here. Uh, and I'm going to get a third monitor or a second monitor, third screen, uh, sooner than later at some point. Um, so that's what I use. Uh, the Hobbit was shot at 48 frames a second. And the IIRC, what is IIRC? I forget that. Um, that, that, yeah, the speed, the frames per second definitely didn't help it at all because we're all conditioned to watching 23.9598, basically 24 frames a second. Uh, and that's where we, people found the right kind of 
happy middle ground for what you know motion blurs at and looks right at and the amount of frames we we just kind of set, i forget why we settled on that it was more so out of necessity i think and saving money originally than out of what looks real because more i think more realistic movement is more frames per second right that's more real because we we don't see in 24 frames a second we see it at, i think it's more like 60 between 60 and one Maybe it's even higher. I forget the those the corridor crew. Those guys on YouTube they did a great video recently on creating like an eyeball camera. I forget what they found. It was a high frame rate though. I think it was like one hundred fifty eight or something around there. I think. I think it's like the frames per second that we can can perceive roughly. Um, so if you wanted a realistic, it'd probably be like closer to that one twenty one sixty frames per second. Um, but we just you know we're so conditioned to watching twenty four frames a second now for film and 30 frames a second or so for tv and then that's that's really the thing so anything higher than 24 frames which i doubled it in 48 you know for the hobbit that yeah it just looked too fluid too smooth and that just sort of took everyone out a bit of um what they're used to seeing um soup says he she says good evening sorry who says good evening um alex what's up how you doing? Uh, sorry, I'm catching up on previous chat. Hello, you make it more available to download. Uh, no, this won't be available to download, but I probably will sell it um, as a as a kit you can buy. Um, I think I can sell it, but uh, highly suggest to you uh, because the movie has three genres of mystery, thriller, and satire. So you rarely encounter in the rest of the movies. Oh, okay, so um, is that I guess you're referring to? Uh, Gone Girl. Really hard to get real life likenesses. It can be, yeah. It's definitely a challenge. Uh, it's unique. It's, the director is great. Super formidable. Directed an integrated movie. I've never seen it, honestly. Suggest to you the whole movie. <laughs> okay, I'll check it out. I'll watch that today. Pop that in as I... Uh, I'll stream it as I work on other projects. Um, mess with lighting and matters of visual effects. Research to you. Movie name suggestion. Okay. Um, John, hello. Uniform frame rate. Yep. He's supposed to create the sim look. Excuse me. How do you put the brushes down on the left side? Oh, um, that's just customizing your. Uh, you just customize your. Uh, UI. So you want to do that. You want to come here. Uh, what is it? Config. And you enter customize. All right. So you click on that. Enable customize. And now you can uh, take whatever you want. So if you wanted those brushes, you know, you come over here, brush, hold control and alt, and then grab one and then just drag it down here and then let go. And then it would be placed there, you know, or you can put it anywhere, anywhere in the frame here. That's where you can do that. That's how you can drop the brushes where you want. So you can have a faster access to them. Um, take the brushes down, sorry. Uh, Slate, but happy Thanksgiving, Dan and Chad. Joe, thank you, sir. Happy belated Thanksgiving to you too. Um, in Russian, oh, okay, sorry. That's what he was saying in Russian. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Thank you. Um, good evening, good day. How do you say that in Russian in return? <laughs> uh, and let's see what else we got here. Render at your country's hertz. Turn everything so it destroys footage from many platforms. Yeah, there's shooting speed and playback speed. Play it at 20 frames is really weird. Oh, really? Huh. You can try it with ZBrush recording option. Got to get it relevant to the stream. Got to keep it relevant to the stream. Yeah, interesting. Huh. I'm not 24 frames a second at all. Um. For me, movies need much more frame rate, despite what some people say. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say you're probably in the minority. Um, I know a lot of people are very comfortable with 24. I am actually too. I I, I feel like watching higher rate, higher speed frame rate. Um, it's interesting. It's like intriguing to watch, but it's still it just feels like it. It's like the when can you have the interpolation happening too, like with TVs when. Plasmas and flash screens started just coming out and getting more popular. They would have, they still have it now, but everyone disables it. Or I think a lot of them now come with it disabled initially, but it'll interpolate frames. So it'll create a smoother, what they call a soap opera 
effect because they would film soap operas um, with TV cameras that would shoot either at 30 or higher frames a second. And so it would just look, it was like either 30 or 60. It was like silky smooth, right? And there was a lot of, I remember in the UK, they, were, they kept, they kept um, older uh, cameras and older lenses around longer. And so they shot a lot of their TV on with these really kind of crappy lenses, but these cameras had a lot more, you know, frame rate, higher frame rate, a lot more frames per second. So they had this really just um, kind of muddy, murky, you know, uh, kind of blurry and like, you know, like very stars. Like they had a lot of these um, uh, different effects that were just, that were just factors. I think they were just, um, you know, effects that were just um, byproduct of the lenses and cameras they used in the UK. But that was something that was very common is a higher frame rate. And um, yeah, higher frame rate. And like, there was a weird, I don't know what it was. It was at the ISO or the aperture, something that would cause like, kind of like with those old 70s music videos, you have like a lot of like delayed, like light burn and motion blur kind of sustained. So when you do quick movements, you just see this like, almost like when you're in, at nighttime, you see a light pass by, you see a streak kind of follow it. It was kind of that effect. I don't know what the technical terms are for it. Um, I just found that it was interesting and kind of jarring at times too, when, you, when you'd see that in uh, footage from either old music videos from the UK or just a lot of stuff from like 70s and early 80s. Um, all today's monitors and displays play any footage at a higher hertz, uh, one hertz equal one frame. Filming 24, the computer will duplicate missing frames, causing the horrible playback at any platform. Hmm. 80s, yeah. Create the sin playback in post and render at 60. Interesting. Alex, yeah, do they have the habit of seeing movies 24 frames a second? And they decide if they do and make it higher frames per second. I think we will, we all would see it as a step forward. Maybe. I ever thought to have a Q&A session uh, or doing a review maybe in your own channel? Um, I mean, I could. I don't know. I've never thought that that many people would be <laughs> interested in the, in doing a Q&A with me. Um. I'm pretty much a nobody at this point still. And, uh, but I mean, sure. I mean, if anyone would want to, sure. Why not? <laughs> um, I'm more interested in, in interviewing other people, you know, like I'm definitely, I'm, I'm looking to start up my podcast here soon and I'll be interviewing some interesting, uh, sound designers and composers and, uh, actors and, uh, um, you know, some effects legends and like friends of mine who happen to be some pretty well-known and, uh, talented folks who i'm a huge fan of and many people many of us are i believe you know uh so looking to set up i already have a couple people lined up and i need to get some more game designers you know all kinds of scientists doctors like i you know all my interests and i'm a huge science and arts aficionado so it's going to be mostly people from those camps but science is huge it's in technology it's engineering it's medicine you know so i'm gonna, I'm gonna have all kinds of different people come in and well, come in virtually, I guess, you know, digitally, uh, online, but, um, but yeah, it should be really cool. It should be really fun. Looking forward to it, actually. So I'm looking to have it. Um, I just got to get the intro done because it's a whole big, um, I really want to have a nice, a nice intro for the, uh, I already have it all done up here, but, um, I have the music already lined up, everything. I just need to, just to put together the, uh, intro, which will encompass a little bit of Unreal and, uh, and some After Effects, you know, kind of stuff and some shots from LA and all this kind of stuff, sort of kind of a, you know, taking inspiration from Charlie Rose and <laughs> other, uh, other talk shows that I, you know, was a fan of. And uh, of course we all know about, um, so there's going to be some of that, you know, so it's, it'll be a cool, it'll be a pretty, I think pretty cool, exciting podcast for a lot of people to listen to or watch. Uh, so I'll, let, I'll, you know, of course I'll post on my Instagram when that's going to happen, um, when the first one's going up. But I'm hoping to have one, the first episode, uh, and I'll try to do it like, 
I don't know. It'd be great to do it weekly, but I'm not sure I'll have enough people lined up to do it weekly. Um, so I'm, it might be a monthly thing at this point or like a bi a bi weekly thing, so every two weeks maybe. Um, but I'm looking to have one fine the first one finally up in this in December. Um, then maybe hopefully, you know, time will allow after the holidays to do round two in mid uh, mid January. Um, but we'll see. You know, so one step at a time. Um, but Joey, yeah, I mean Joey, Joe D, Joe, if you, uh, yeah, I mean if you like me to, I'm sure I could put something together on my um, Twitch channel. Um, rock band at 6K res. I wish I knew how to do shaders. <laughs> uh you have plenty of experiences and each of the anatomy sculpt that you made looks perfect oh thanks man uh how you put the brushes down on the left side <laughs> john you asked again i don't know john maybe you missed it um if you want to do your brushes or anything on the side you want to turn you go to preferences all right you click here on config then you go to enable customize from there you go to brush and then cho choose whatever brush you want let's say you just want the clay brush somewhere else hold control and alt then click on it, drag, and then drop. And there, there's your brush. And you just do the same thing with every single brush. So if you don't want something and you don't like where it is, just click, hold, I mean, so, or, sorry, um, control alt, and then click, drag into your document. Oop, gone, done. And then once you're happy with that, you turn off enable customize and you want to store config. Click that, it'll save it so that every time you open up ZBrush, you'll have your UI the way it is. Uh, make sure you do that don't forget otherwise after you've put all this work into setting up your ui and you close out a zbrush it'll all be reset to its factory original so you'll hate yourself um so that's storing the config you also want to save your ui so then you can put it into any future zbrush or on another computer you want to go to save ui and then it'll allow you to save a file wherever you like i usually put mine in documents and it'll call itself custom user interface 2021 as a default name of course you call it whatever you want but that's fine for me so i usually keep it something like that or i put it like the year and then i'll put q whatever whatever quarter of the year we're in so one through four um so that's my thing that's how i do it um so yeah uh that's 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 how you configure your ui to have brushes where you like and of course you can put other buttons too like how you added all these extra buttons down here same process um yeah so you know just do it to your heart's content. Uh, no problem. Don't mind explaining it again. Uh, you can put transforms box on the left. Uh, transform box. What do you mean the transform box? You mean you mean some any of these elements? Uh, yeah. I mean you can put any of this stuff. Any of the stuff you can drag, just like I did with the brushes. You know, just hold Control and Alt and drag it to wherever you want. Uh, the whole box, I don't think you mean like this whole little sub palette. I don't think you can necessarily take it as it is and drop it in somewhere, but you can take all those separate buttons and just drag them. So you create the same exact, you know, placement of them on a side area and you can thicken these, these, uh, these areas too. You can bulk them up and make them thicker with more buttons if you want. So they're wide enough to hold more, you know, and you can also double tap this to like shrink stuff down. You know, so you can you can have you can dock you know you can always dock your transform palette too, like that. Excuse me, you just go to transform, click on this little like what looks almost like a power button, and then drag it over here, and then boom, you know, and then you can just hide it then if you don't want to see it, and then pull it up again by just double tapping on these little arrows, you know, and then get rid of it the same way that you do with uh, when you have control enabled. Uh, I mean, customize enabled. So you know, little things like that. It's fun little easy tricks to uh, expedite your. Uh, whole process the workflow um, yeah simple but yeah joe um is it joe d or joe die i don't know how you want me to say the name uh you do you, uh are you following me on twitch and for those who don't know i guess i'll put that in here now as we're coming close to a close for today uh this is my social media stuff if you guys want to uh follow me elsewhere uh so my ig instagram it's where i keep i think most of my updates really um where you'll see most of them will be on instagram so you can follow me on there daniel line arts trying to grow it so if you want to follow along or have any friends who might be interested in zbrush cg and corgis and sculptures and 
stuff like that. You'll see that on my Instagram page. I gotta get better at posting more. I just, I don't know. I've always kind of lamented social media to a certain degree. I'll go in spurts too. I'll just post a bunch of stuff and then I won't post anything for a while. But um, anyway, uh, so that's IG. Uh, Facebook, I'm just a meme machine on Facebook at this point. So probably not really worth sharing Facebook. Um, uh, what else though? Twitch. Uh, let's see what it is. It's I'm trying to remember. It's twitch.tv. Arts. So you can follow me on Twitch there. I believe that's correct. Um, Twitter. Uh, Twitter is not really that relevant either. Um, again, it's just it's like Twitter and Facebook have divulged and devolved into a divulge, devolved into uh, just just political banter and, and or arguments. I don't really get involved in arguments so much. I'll just repost whatever I like or think or agree with. Um, retweet. Um, but people just go to such extremes with all that too. So I just try to keep it more lighthearted or at least interesting, factual, but, um, so that, yeah, it's Twitter. My Twitter and Facebooks aren't really as art centric as, uh, my Instagram or my Twitch, I guess, which is almost nothing on my Twitch, uh, YouTube as well. I'll be posting some stuff on there. Uh, so if you want to follow me on YouTube, pretty easy to remember. It's just, uh, same thing. YouTube uh, dot com slash fine arts. Correct. Is that correct. All right. There you go. Um, so that's kind of all the social media stuff right now, I guess. It's relevant. Um, I'm also on a bunch of other stuff. You know, there's um, what is there? There's there's um, Marco Polo, there's Parlor now, there's uh, MeWe, I'm on all that stuff too, uh, Minds, uh, but I don't really post a lot on there, I kind of just, I'm watching, I'm watching these things come out, and uh, you know, they're not being as censored as certain platforms are, like Twitter and Facebook, so there's a bit more freedom on there, and I like that. Uh, I'm not so much anti-left as I am just pro-hearing everybody, and it's a lot of the uh, other platforms are kind of just very hard left-leaning politically, and not open for both sides to really say everything they want. Um, even YouTube, unfortunately, is you know censoring um, some conservatives, and I lean more conservative than than liberal. But I mean, I'm a pretty balanced person. I'm not a radical. <laughs> I like to hear both sides, and I'll take. I agree with both sides. You know, there's parts I agree with and parts I disagree with. But I lean more conservative than I do um, left. But uh, it's also because I'm a very pro like freedom, pro freedom of speech. You know, uh, so that's just. That's just me. It's my take, of course. And I try not to shove it down anyone's throat, but I I think it's it's hard to shove down freedom. It's just like you do you, right? You express yourself. So I'm very much just live and let live, kind of just, you know, don't hurt each other and let's just try to get along. Uh, so that's my that's my general stance. It's usually pretty good to it's usually pretty acceptable <laughs> amongst rational folk, I think. Let's all get along. Let's, let's try to love each other, be kind to each other, let's not get crazy. So anyway, that's my uh, social media rant. Figures not equivalent to frames. Amount of frames a monitor can display is dependent on the refresh rate, not the hertz. Of course, with the, the more potency it has, the higher. Yeah. Refresh rate it can have measured in hertz. Frame is directly related to hertz. Oh, yeah, I keep hearing back and forth about that, right? I think the higher the higher the hertz, the more frame rate, the higher the frame rate it can display. So it's like it kind of goes one way, but not the other. So like you can't watch a hundred, you can't watch accurately one hundred twenty frames per second on a sixty hertz TV or monitor, but you can watch less than that hertz and it'll display it accurately, if I'm not mistaken. So I think you're both wrong and right, <laughs> because like I'll make little videos or like a you know I'm working on my reel now and other things and I'll do like a little ad or promo or something and it'll be exported out at either 30 frames or 24 frames a second um and it'll display just fine on a on 120 hertz monitor that i have here um you know or like i realized unfortunately uh, um, that i got a because i didn't think about the ps5 coming out so I, I was lucky to get a ps5 but i have a, a great a wonderful tv in the living room and it's uh 
big Samsung um, 4K, but it's a 60 hertz monitor. So I, you know, I can't watch 124. I can't put my PlayStation into 100, 120 frames per second mode because it won't display on a hertz that's less than 120 hertz. So I can't watch or play games at 120 hertz. So I'd have to upgrade my TV. I have to buy a new TV to um, that has 120 hertz or you know 240 or whatever to, in order to play at least 120 frames a second gameplay. So. So there you go. There's the whole Hertz versus frame rate thing explained. As far as I understand it, I'm not the leading expert in that by any means. But from what I understand, you know. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's supposed to be because it speeds up the game. That's why they can rip uh, Sony on PC. Why they can't rip, rip off Sony on PC? You hear the trash being picked up. It's very late. <laughs> I don't know if that was a trash truck. It's a Sunday. I don't think that was a trash truck. I think that might have been uh was it trash? I don't know. It might have been like a there's a lot of deliveries happening and it might have been like a UPS truck or a uh FedEx truck. Because now everybody's you know, having stuff delivered and shipped to them. Now more than ever. Uh, yep, man, did follow you or Twitch YouTube too. Oh, uh, do I have a Discord? I don't have it. I mean, I'm on Discord, but I'm just in different Discord groups, I guess. I'm not a Discord expert either. I haven't really like fully explored all its options as that's all this stuff takes time. <laughs> and it's like I'm dividing my time as much like as wisely as I can amongst different options. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't have my own Discord group yet by any means. Um, I don't I know if I would have a big of a following. I mean, hey, if people want to follow me, cool. I'm all for it. Um, I hope they will grow more once I start my podcast and start start sort of you know really having my own my own thing with uh, friends and guests that I would like to um, you know talk with and ask questions, pick their brains, um, and I'm gonna try my best to not ask as I'm gonna ask as few questions that have already been asked of these people as possible because. I know I can empathize and understand that after being asked the same question 60,000 times that you can find any video of on YouTube of that person being interviewed, being asked the same question, I would imagine it gets old and they're tired of like robotically regurgitating the same answer every time they're asked the same question. And I get tired of seeing the same answer when I, you know, I have the same question that millions of other people do. And then I go watch them, watch the first interview of them being asked that question. It's like, oh, you see how interested they are and happy to share. Then by the 20th time that same question is asked, you hear them give the exact same like line, the robotic like brrr, just this printout of the same answer. And I'm like, God, that's got to be just boring too to not be able to really be much more authentic in your answer because you can only, there's only so many ways to say two plus two is four. You know, <laughs> it's like the answer is going to be the same no matter who's asking it. So at some point I'm imagining that just it's got to, I would get tired of saying the same answer to everybody eventually. But I mean, some people are super narcissists and they love talking about themselves all the time. So who knows? I'm sure some actors don't mind it, but um, plus two, I mean, come on, if that's like the worst of your day, it's a pretty, pretty easy life. <laughs> but uh, still, I can understand that it, it must get tiring answering the same questions over and over. So I'm going to try to keep, I'm going to try to, you know, do my research, do my due diligence when it comes to, uh, Asking guests questions. Might ask them to give some background, or I'll be the one to give the background on them quickly so that you can bring up to speed anybody who's not that familiar with whomever's on the show. Um, but yeah, I, I would hope that I could bring a unique unique spin to, to you know, the whole interview process. Um, and I'll probably try to do some other unique stuff to it too, like have a I loved um, James Lipton and uh, Inside the Actors Studio. I loved that show. Uh, and he always closed out with a certain set of questions he'd ask every guest. But they would always have different answers. And it would always be unique and interesting to hear what they'd have to say. Sometimes funny, sometimes moving, you know, just a wide gamut of answers. And so uh, I think I'm going to devise something like that, too. But I want to have some fun with it, too. So I'll have some ridiculous, funny questions. You know, there's the classic dumb stuff that people love asking people, too, like, would you like to fight a bear-sized duck, one bear-sized duck, or fifty duck-sized bears? You know, <laughs> like dumb stuff like that. I don't think I need to ask them that. <laughs> Although it could be fun here and there. Um, Ricky Gervais seems to get a kick out of some of that stuff. Um, for anyone who follows Ricky Gervais on Twitter or now on Instagram, his his stuff is hilarious, and he'll do Q and A's, and he'll get like <laughs> some people who have a. <laughs> 
I'm with this woman, I think, rescued this really adorable, fat Jack Russell Terrier named Rupert. And so Rupert, the chubby, overweight dog, will always ask him <laughs> the most ridiculous questions. Uh, it's pretty hilarious. So it's something to watch for sure. If you guys haven't seen Ricky Gervais's uh, streams on, on Twitter or Instagram, go follow him. Uh, they're pretty freaking hilarious. His Q&A's. He's on YouTube, too. I think under Baller. Like B-A-L-R, I think. You can follow him on there. I, just, I love Ricky Gervais's uh, snarky, uh, irreverent humor. Quite funny. Definitely my taste. Um, sorry, I missed a bunch of stuff here. What do we got? Um... Got a bit confused with the monitor the refresh rate. Da -da -da -da. That's times frames a second. So 144 hertz, or so one hertz equals does not equal one frame, or is equal to it. They are directly related but not equivalent. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah. Same time. There's so much. It gets buried and hard to find when you're looking for an answer. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's going to go on a case by case basis too. I think we're going to be careful with you know who I have and what I ask them, of course, so that it's, it's fun and interesting for everybody. Mostly, of course, I want them to feel you know comfortable and have fun. Uh, can't do more frames per second. They fresh rate. Yep. Uh, not that it matters at that speed, your eyes can't even keep up. Right. After a certain point, it gets too fast. Yeah. Saying two plus two is four is, is only boring. It's four, mother. <laughs> if you can't do an impression, Samuel Jackson. Yeah, man. <laughs> anyway, we are at four o'clock, and at least the hand has gotten to a point where it's like, hey, it looks okay. I mean, I think it'd still be a little better. You know, I might just see about. A little bit more definition of the, uh... oh man, my brain is farting. Ligaments, tendons, tendons. Uh, what is what again? I, see, this is terrible because I have a medical background, but I always forget. Like, ligaments join bone to bone, tendons go from muscle to bone, right? Yeah, I always get those two confused. So I think these would be tendons, if I'm not mistaken, over the meta metacarpals. You got your metacarpals up here, and you got your metatarsals, which are the mirrored version of them on your feet. Right? It's come before the phalanges, which are your fingers. All right. So yeah, I'm looking okay with this. I, mean, I might add a little squiggly, gentle squiggly vein, maybe. That's about it. Let me soften that up. A little. Uh. Oh, that's why it looks so solid, because I had that all the way up to the alpha. All right, let's try that again. Nice, natural yeah. vein. I'll turn up the Z a little bit more. I'm a little too strong. Mm, I want that a little softer. I mean, I keep thinking about my hands that have veins popping out a little bit, but maybe women don't have that much. I guess not, huh? I don't know. I'm trying to think of women's hands. They have to have some of that, right? I'm just not looking at a real <laughs> woman's hand right now. So they have to have a little bit of a little bit of vein. Uh, vein in their alpha library. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. I like drawing my own veins, though. I like stamping everything. Um, they have to have like the same. I mean, I know it's, the vascularity is, it varies uh, person to person, but uh, I can actually look at a woman's hand here. Yeah, actually, the vascularity is often not as much as the dudes. At least all the hand models you'll find, they're just not. They're not as nearly as vascular. They don't have that popping out like, like this. <laughs> um, 
at least from all the photos and seeing the hand models. Yeah, very, very, very subtle. Almost nothing. I guess this is fine. Yeah, it's fine. Cool. All right. Still not perfectly happy with it, but yeah, it's good enough. It's going to be a small hand, too. So, tiny hand. Come on, reveal all. There we go. Ta da. All right. Cool. One hand down. Still feels kind of weird. I don't know. I think the thinness of the wrist and the size of the hand it almost feels like the hand should be just a little smaller, right? Where. Center and scale. Yeah, it does feel kind of big. That's the thing. It feels kind of bare posh. Kind of feels a little giant for the wrist. That looks better. It's too proportionately to the head, you know what I mean? Like, I think about your hand to your head. Like, your hand usually could cover most of your face, but that's about it proportionally. It should be almost like the... the like, most of your face should be able to be covered by your one hand, but not much. Not much more. You shouldn't be able to, like, palm your whole head like a basketball. <laughs> Unless you're a giant. So I think that little bit... I think that little bit helped. Maybe even could go smaller still. Yeah, I feel like that's I feel like that's about right. Yeah, I think that looks better. It's throwing off the wrist a little bit though, so we gotta move it up. And the bony nodule of the uh the ulnar Ul ulnar notch, I think that's what it's called, ulnar whatever, the process, the something ulnar process, right? I forget. My anatomy is rusty when it comes to all the names, all the nomenclature. I haven't reviewed it in a long time. All right. Eh, it's looking better. Probably still could use a little, a little touching up, but... Yeah, that'll do for now, I guess. That'll do big. That'll do. Random lines from movies. Babe. Babe the pig. Anyone remember Milo and Otis? I used to love that movie when I was a kid. I love animals, dude. I'm thinking of all these animal movies. Um, I never liked Babe that much. It was okay. I thought Milo and Otis was great. Dudley Moore doing all the voices. Awesome. Anyway, <laughs> uh, do I usually use these for rigging? No, I don't. Just transpose posing. Yes, just transfer posing. Elbow, cough, cough. Oh, is the elbow terrible? What about the elbow? Too chunky? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little tight in there. What are you, what are you saying about the elbow though? You're knocking my elbow. I didn't really do anything with it yet, so. Probably need a little bit more definition. Is that what you're saying? Just pull it out a little bit more. Triceps probably a little flexed. Maybe a little less. I mean, she's definitely going to be using it here a bit to pull back on the arm, but I don't need it too pronounced. Um. No, the fox and the hound is the fox and the hound. Milo and Otis is about it's a real it's real footage of two of a kitten and a pug puppy that go on this adventure together. And I think sadly in the process of making it, they killed a few kittens or pugs, which is really sad. I only learned about that like recently. I was like, oh, it's terrible. What the hell, man? I think it was before PETA existed too, so they didn't have or the Humane League or whatever. They didn't have people coming in to monitor animal abuse and make sure that they weren't hurting animals. So 
That's something else Ricky Gervais says a lot about, and I like, is that he's all about being kind to animals. So, we just got a cat, too, recently. Pickle. Pickle the cat. Um, elbow caught, elbow caught. Um... Oh, it's probably that was in response to something else, not to my actual elbow and her. Time to look for some female hand references. <laughs> Underage here. Uh, so, yeah, how to paint a loop in high poly. Uh, illegal somewhere in the world. I'm show us your hands, baby. <laughs> God. Got it. Okay, that's what I was missing. Um... No, I don't use these spheres. No, Milo noticed that uh, Jesus Christ, man, how many Benjis did they kill back then? <laughs> no, I think the Benjis actually were pretty uh, pretty well kept alive. Um, but I think they just went through a lot of they bred Benji dogs, you know. Dude, Benji the Hunted. I love Benji the Hunted, dude. As a kid, uh, I love that movie. And I can't believe how they did some of those shots. And I'm hoping they just threw like a dummy wolf. There's a scene where Benji tricks this black, beautiful wolf that's chasing him. He goes underneath these bushes, and the wolf jumps over the bushes that are right on this cliff, and the thing just, it looks like they really threw, because the way the body moves and everything, I'm like, I hope they made, like, a really realistic dummy wolf, or that the wolf was slaughtered. I don't, I don't want it to be killed, but somehow, it looks like the wolf just does a leap, and it just corkscrews over and just howls as it goes over a cliff that would kill anybody. And uh, I was like, good God, that looks 100% real. I just hope it wasn't a real living animal that just got chucked over unless there's a net or a big pillow or something down there to catch the poor thing i don't know that's just crazy anyway crazy animal movies man but i love benji the benji movies man the first one i think it was called for the love of benji or something and then uh benji the hunted those were the two i remember as a kid love those movies watched them on repeat when i was very young classics i don't know i think that's part of that and having a pet dog mikey Dog Mikey was our first dog. I think that's what made me love animals so much is uh, being exposed to um, animals at a young age, being presented in a very compassionate way. Sadly, not everybody feels that way about animals, though. So I don't know. I love animals, though. I feel bad, bad uh, about hunting. I could never. Unless I had to. Unless it was apocalypse. I'm not going to go hunting. So anyway. Uh, we are off topic, but hey, it's okay. Uh, Dan, do you know the story of Hades and, uh, Persephone? I don't. I know Persephone, um, I know she's a prevalent, a very prevalent, uh, goddess. And Hades, I forget Hades. I'll have to look it up. I'll have to look it up, Joe. Um, okay, guys, but anyway, we're over time by 10 minutes, so I'm gonna bounce. And the corgi is here, asking for treats. Does anybody want to see the corgi before we go? Share, share the corgi. Share the corgi love. Medusa. This is great. I'll, I'll pick up the corgi quick and then I'm out of here. Uh, don't eat fruit from strangers. <laughs> oh, it's left behind. You don't know what I'm doing. Oh. <laughs> this is the corgi. Who's that? Right there. Where's that? Yeah. Oh, hi. Oh, yes, I love you. Breathe into the mic. What's that? Say hi. You speak? You speak? Speak. Hi. Yes, I love you. Hello. Okay, well, he's ready to go. I have a friend over, so he wants to go and play and work. He's so big now. Oh, he's been the same size, man. He's 12. He's been this size for uh, a decade. Um, but he's, yeah, he's a beautiful boy. He's my corgi. It's funny, he looks big on camera, but people see him in real life and they say he's a small corgi. So, I don't know. He's somewhere in the middle. But yeah, this is Einstein. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you carrying me? Oh, good boy. Good boy. Okay, now, you probably see a little bit. Black shirt's covered in white fur. It's great. It's corgi shed, like, there's no tomorrow. You can make a sweater out of their hair in, like, a day. Anyway, all right, guys, I'm out of here. Um, Zebras 2021, Daniel Corgi meets Ashley Corgi. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Ashley's Corgi, too. Uh, she's a cutie. Uh, flesh meat. <laughs> guys. Uh, yeah, he's a beautiful.
beautiful dog. Dogs are the best. Yes, they are. All right, guys. Long goodbye. Take care. Don't get the Rona. Eat a lot of leftovers. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. I guess Hanukkah's happening now, right? I don't know. I was asking my Jewish friends. Anyway, take care. Bye-bye. Have fun. See you guys in uh, a week. Week and a half, something like that. All right.